I, I find that um, one of the secrets of modern British life is the sense that it often feels as though there isn't any power anywhere. And so politicians spend a lot of time, I don't know, thinking that journalists have power and the journalists maybe think the business people have power and the business people maybe think the politicians have power and so on and so forth. The reality of being a minister is very, very odd. So when I was um, Secretary of State for International Development, I was in charge of a budget of 20 billion US dollars a year, so 13,000 million pounds a year, with almost no constraint. It was legally protected by an act of parliament. There was no interference from the treasury. There was no interference from the prime minister. And yet, oddly, it didn't feel like the kind of power that I had when I was running a small charity on the ground in Afghanistan. Yeah. So when I was on the ground in Afghanistan, I was under buildings. We had a couple of hundred staff. I could see water supply going in. I could see clinics being built. I could get involved in the design of a balcony or worry about where the electricity system was coming in. As a Secretary of State, you sit in an enormous office and you sign bits of paper. That's and like being a Roman emperor, you know, we'll come back to this. I mean, this, this is so, I, I want to, I'm going to throw that back at you. Um, it, it is something that interests me. I mean, you have the idea that somebody like the Emperor Hadrian has a lot of power. But of course, he can only be in one place at one time. Now, he travels around a great deal, but wherever he is, he's just here. Yeah. And what he's doing at the other end of the empire is presumably, A, takes a certain amount of time for the message to get through, but B, is dependent on person after person after yeah. person. He can't actually, I don't know if he's standing in Britain, yeah. worry too much about exactly what's happening in the design of a forum in Spain. No, that, that's true. And uh, in, in the Roman Empire, you can explain if you want to. I don't think it's the complete explanation, but you can explain the powerlessness of the person apparently in power on practical infrastructural grounds. You know, that, you know, you've got your governor in Bithynia and he's asked you a question, but the letter's taken three months to get to you and it's going to take three months for you to send the reply, by which time he's going to have to have made his own mind up. You know, you cannot control that. And I think ancient historians, and I'm, you know, I'm guilty here, we, we blame that you know, on the practicalities of it. But of course, when you know, talking to someone like you and saying, well, how does it feel like to be a minister? As a minister, you can communicate instantly, but you still have that sense that things are going on around you and you're not controlling them. And in a sense, there is a, you know, where we think power is, there's often a kind of black hole where the person apparently wielding it, and I think that's an interesting word, um, is, you know, is, is sitting there wondering what the hell to do, aren't they? Yeah. I mean, it's, it, it, this is partly, I mean, something I think would be definitely worth uh, talking to Mary much more about, which is the bureaucracy, because, of course, the reality is that, and, and Mary's wonderful book, which if any of you haven't bought, she must read, um, is very, very good on the fact that on the surface there are very, very few civil servants working in the Roman system. A lot of soldiers, an enormous number of soldiers compared to the population, but surprisingly few people that we would describe as civil servants running this whole setup. But my experience as a minister is that the relationship, and I don't know whether this would be true of an emperor with uh, an emperor's civil servants, but certainly I changed in my life from being a civil servant. I was briefly a British soldier. I was then a diplomat in the Foreign Office. And I thought when I became a minister, I was just like a senior civil servant. So I could sit around a table and I could have a sort of debate, like a seminar about what to do or what not to do. And we'd come to a conclusion. I'd make a decision. It would happen. Nothing of the sort. It's completely impossible to do things like that. I realized very, very slowly that to get anything done, I had to actually do what I hated doing, which is create the three-word slogan, reach over the head to the public. So in prisons, for example, I spent um, 
Nearly six months having a discussion on what we could do about violence in prisons, I was getting absolutely nowhere. It was only when I said to the BBC, I will resign in 12 months unless violence comes down in prisons, that I then got some power. Then suddenly I could set up an operations room. I could focus on 10 prisons. Some money came my way. The civil service sort of woke up. They had a target to aim for, and everybody got behind the idea. Um, and I, I'm, I wonder whether there's a, anything that we can see of that, whether maybe, and I, I was thinking, we were talking about this in the green room, whether emperors can't change small things, but they can occasionally pull huge levers. <laughs> so they can, for example, we were talking about, I can't remember who it is, is it Septimus Severus, who suddenly makes everybody Caracalla. a Roman citizen? Caracalla. Okay. So, oh. so how does that work? You wake up one day and you suddenly think you're going to make everybody a Roman citizen. Those big changes are, of course, the changes that none of us can actually explain. I mean, you can see that the Roman Empire quite resiliently carries on, probably a bit by luck, um, as much as anything else. You know, they don't get found out. They don't ask too much. Um, the idea of Roman control is a very limited uh, bit of control. What you have in the middle is a guy who, if he's successful, has learned to act the part of the emperor. It's, it's performance politics, which I suspect is not unlike our own. Um, and then very occasionally in the history of, what, 300 years of the Roman Empire, you find someone like Caracalla, who's a frightful bruiser by all accounts, you know, absolute hard-headed, shit-faced guy, right? Suddenly he says, Every free person in the Roman Empire will be a citizen. It's the biggest grant of citizenship to uh, uh, ever made anywhere, ever. Can I, can I interrupt for a second? So this is a guy who's he's a professional military man. He's quite sort of tough. He's quite ruthless. And then suddenly he manages to do this quite extraordinary political thing. I'm not sure. I mean, he does have a good reputation with the soldiers, and he kind of dresses up quite convincingly, part of the act, you know, in little military skirts. Um, um, uh, and, you know, he's, he's a guy who's gone down in history as... as I mean, kind of nasty. I mean, the, his nastiest moment was um, having his brother, who was partly a co-ruler with him, his brother Gator, murdered in the palace, um, put to death on his mother's lap, while Gator cried out, apparently, and this is either a hopelessly pathetic moment in Roman history or terribly poignant, he said, um, Mummy, mummy, I'm being killed. And that Caracalla is the mastermind here. Um, he's eventually assassinated by uh, the soldiers in the middle of a pee. Actually, he's having a pee while on campaign, and they choose that as the moment to do him in. But his, his major claim to fame is this massive extension of citizenship, and we cannot understand why he did it.